Hi everyone and welcome to the Coaching Observer. I'm Coach Sian, providing you with some key insights from a coach's point of view with regards to game strategy, predictions, outcomes, key positions for all rugby enthusiasts, some fans, some spectators and as well as emerging coaches. So I've previously covered the Wales-Argentina game, the first quarterfinal. Now second up, I'm going to cover our next quarterfinal game, which is a big one, right? Ireland versus New Zealand. So this is possibly one of the biggest uh, quarterfinal games for me, um, other than South Africa and France. Um, it's, oh, yeah, intense to say. I think that the winner of this game is possibly going to win the World Cup. Um, I think that they are both favorite teams. And I think where Ireland is sitting at the moment is a beautiful place to be. They are a team that has gelled, that has a huge winning uh, streak at the moment, you know, and th they've really found themselves and I've enjoyed watching them. So Ireland is a strong, formidable team. Um, you know, the the amount of results that Farrell has gotten, um, Coach Andy Farrell, he's, he's, he's brilliant. He's been with them for a long time now and he's brought a different dynamism to, to the Irish rugby. Um, I also think that Irish rugby is at quite a good peak at the moment. I think they're peaking at a good time. Um, they are also have a, a good, a good round or a good a good collaboration of, of players. You know, if I look at ages, if I look at positions, if I look at key players, um, they're a well-rounded team, and I think that they complement each other very well. Now, on the other side of that, Ireland has never won a World Cup, right? So if I look at New Zealand, who's won three World Cups. Uh, who's extremely formidable force um, under the coach Ian Foster at the moment. They, they've gone through a bit of a hard season uh, with regards to post-2019 World Cup or even the 2019 World Cup losing uh, in the semi-final the way they did against England um, and trying to build themselves again with such a huge pool of players and you know to really find which players gel well, which guys in different positions. I mean, you know, they have such utility with regards to the back line and the loose trio. Um, and and how how are they complementing each other? I think that we've seen some you know world greatest uh, uh, New Zealand teams, uh, Dan Carter era or you know 2015 2011. Like we've seen some phenomenal teams. And is this New Zealand team living up to that standard, um, or or has the competition caught up quite a bit? So it, it's a hard game to analyze. Um, I'll, I'll dig deep into this one. I think it's going to be a beautiful clash of Northern Southern Hemisphere. Like I said, I feel that the winner of this is probably going to win the World Cup. I know a big, bold statement, um, but it's, it's, it's really something I've thought about since pre-World Cup when everyone asks me who's winning, uh, you know, who's, who's quarterfinal, who's semifinal, who's my top three or four teams. Um, they, they've always been there. I'm, I'm a bit sad that they're meeting each other now already. Um, I would have liked, I don't know, maybe one of them to be on the on the other side of the spectrum or on the other side of the quarterfinals over there, but they're not. So yeah, big clash, guys. Let's get into this one. Let, let, let's see, you know, where the strategy takes us. What my prediction is towards the end. Um, yeah, and let's hit this one out, guys. As I'm sitting here, the teams haven't been announced yet. I just went and looked for all the lineups. They're not out yet, right? So keep that in mind. I do think we know from both teams who we're expecting in what positions, uh, what, what are the strongest players for this game, um, and to uh, you know complement it with what strategy the teams want to follow. So let me start with Ireland. Uh, I think we know who their starting eight is. You know, I think we know who, who their, their backline players are. I don't think we're seeing any changes. The only one which I don't know who's starting is between the lines, right? I don't know if Conor Murray will start. He'll probably come off the bench. Um, although he, he's shown that he can start, it's also a big, big game. Uh, he's got good results against New Zealand. That's the one I'm not sure about. Uh, we'll see Sexton at 10, guys. Um, the only thing I want to see from Andy Farrell is, is he keeping in Sexton the full game? So if you watched any of the previous Irish games, guys, Sexton comes off the last 15 minutes. And I think those last 15 minutes are going to be detrimental to either side. So it's it's going to either cost you the game or win you the game. And those type of substitutes are going to determine this game. So I think Andy Farrell might actually play Sexton for the full 80. Um, is his fitness there? Is his age going to hinder him? That That's a big question. Okay, uh, guys, Bondi Aki, go to you guys. No, I'm a fan of Aki. I've been you know praising this guy throughout the whole World Cup. He's... he's <laughs> 
he's in his element, guys. He's he's probably the 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 best twelve in the world at the moment, if if you ask me, in my opinion. And he's he's peaking at the, at the most brilliant time. All right, uh, other players that I have to mention, guys, the wings, James Lowe, James Lowe. I'm always going on about him. I know a lot of people don't like him. I always say that, but he's he's pivotal to me. Uh, Hansen will have um, on fourteen as well. So so you know, I don't think a lot of um, positions change. They have um, Van der Fleer, which we know phenomenal. Mahoney as well. Uh, Todd Furlong, like, phenomenal players, guys. We know the starting lineup. I, I don't think we see big changes. Um, I just want to see how Andy Farrell is utilizing the bench. Now, on the side of New Zealand, yeah, it, it pulls my hair a bit because you need to know how they want to attack, right? And which players they're going to use to attack with that. So, what I mean with this, guys, is their forwards are formidable. I think we're seeing Sam Kane. I think we see him, Adi Sevilla. Uh, we, we should definitely be seeing, you know, that, that, that's the normal. Uh, Scott Barrett as well. Um, Retallic probably over Sam. Uh, sorry, not yeah, Sam Whitelock. Um, so it's, it's all right for me. Now, at nine, Aaron Smith, because he's probably been the most consistent line in the world, uh, in my opinion. And 10, this is now where we start changing up. Uh, I think Richie Mahunga... Um, he brings to the team what Ian Foster wants. Um, I don't think they'll slot in a different 10 to start off with. All right. And the big question to me, or the big question mark, is more, more at 15. Uh, this is where my first discussion comes into what the teams want to do. So you put McKenzie at 15 instead of 10. He brings you that constant counter-attack, constant testing um, a very vibrant energy to the game, right? His counterpart, Bowden Barrett. Uh, you put Bowden Barrett at 15, lots of experience, uh, formidable as well, a different element to McKenzie, um, or you obviously put Barrett at 10, but I think it's Moonga at 10. So that's what I'm sticking with. And what does Ian Foster want? To be honest with you, I would go with McKenzie. I love the vibrance that he brings to the game. He is just that X factor, guys, and I know he he runs lateral, but he gets he gets that space every single time. And why do you not want that? Uh, defensively, he puts up his hand as well, but I have a feeling Ian Foster is going to go with Barrett because you know what you get from Barrett. It's it's big game temperament. It's it's make or break, right? So I think we're going to see Barrett on fifteen. That's the big one I would question. I would put McKenzie ahead of Barrett. Uh, I love Barrett, but you know that impact he can bring on utility is just as big. Right, um, 12, 13, we'll see Ioane at 13. The wings are the other bit of a question mark. Do you want strong wings that carry hard? Do you want a bit of dynamism? Um, and who, who do you pair against uh, ex-New Zealander, which is um, obviously low? And who do you pair against Hansen defensively? Th those are the questions I'd ask. So... I think he is going. He sorry, Foster is going to go attack over defense for me. Um, I've 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 highlighted how weak I think, or well, not how weak, just not as strong. Talia is on defense as well as Caleb Clark. I don't think we'll see Caleb Clark. Um, I think we'll see Jordan Williams or J Jordan Wall on on wing. Wall Jordan, sorry, and I think we'll see Talia on wings. I think these have been he's going to wings for most of the World Cup. Uh, they're they're fast man. They're fast. They're dynamic. Um, defensively obviously I've, I've touched on that before as well but but that's that's not the question mark for me is wing so wings and fullback the big question marks and it all depends what the coach wants so yeah i think with regards to selection that's where i'd go to uh if you have any comments on that obviously sorry guys the team hasn't been selected uh, i did look for them uh this is just my train of thought and where i think it's going to go strategies so Guys, yeah, make or break, right? Make or break. I'm going to dive into the Irish defense because it's been extremely formidable. I think the Irish defense is the thing to try to break down. Uh, pool stages, the teams tried it. They didn't always get it right. Um, and now I think they're going to level up. So I, I think that the defense comes that much harder, that much faster. The The speed at which the defense resets is is mind blown to me I, I want to know what type of uh, things they do at training i want to know the communication and and how they got into that structure so brilliantly that they do listen all the all the all the top four teams top five teams in the country or well, sorry in the world they they are brilliant at setting the defense line but the way ireland has done it and 
if you saw wave of the wave of the wave of Scottish just trying to hit into that line, guys, it was like, I don't know, if there was something greater than the Great Wall of China, like it's trying to hit through through that with your bare hands. And, and it's just so difficult. So Irish defense to me has been the key element to all of their success. The, the way they are patient, the way they do not miss first-time tackles, the way they create turnovers, the way they create that um, that deadlock that forces teams to do kicks or that forces teams to run out of energy or run out of options, I've seen it countless times from Ireland. Um, you know that weird limbo stage where where nine is playing backline, but backline doesn't really want the ball. Nine is playing forwards. Forwards are going on by themselves and then getting a turnover. This is what Irish defence does to teams at the moment. So it, it morally yeah. breaks them. It kills their structure. It kills the strategy on attack that they wanted to come with. And it pays off. Um, I think the patience on defence as well as the turnover rate to me is the key thing on Irish defence. So please look, guys, nothing's going to change there. It's it's their forte of the game. Uh, they won't change it. And from what I've seen on matches that New Zealand lose, New Zealand aren't great off the back foot. Um, they are phenomenal players, they can play under pressure, but off the back foot it's something else. And I've seen, again, as South African, when South Africa smashes New Zealand on, on defence, right, which I mean is all their carries are negative and the, the positive hits coming from defence is making them, you know, lose ground. While they're trying to attack, they're losing ground, they're fumbling ball, the ball's going backwards. This is New Zealand at their worst. And I think that this is the type of errors that Ireland is going to force on defense to hit through onto New Zealand. Uh, let's go on to Irish attack, guys. I think Irish attack has been slowly changing. Um, they have a set way of attacking that they've done up until now. And I think we started seeing a few cracks of what they want to introduce in playoffs and what they've been keeping in their artillery uh, for the playoffs. And we're going to see it a bit more. <clears throat> their, their attack works, okay? So very big carries uh, from forwards. But the type of sleek and silk hands at the moment that a well gel team and a trustworthy team just has at the moment. Uh, first try against Scotland is pretty much what I'm talking about, guys. So blind passes, passes off the shoulders, just knowing and being so in sync with your players and not just only backline or only forwards, guys. It's it's the introduction of both both packs, or shall we say, both um, forwards and backs. Uh, I'm missing the name here, what we usually call them. So both of these outfits working together in tandem and just jelling so well, and everything just came off. So the first try Ireland scored against Scotland in the first, what, two, three minutes, it's, it screams that to me. And, and that's frightening to watch as a coach because... You can defend, you can set your defense, but when things like that start coming off and it's that go forward ball and the boys are feeding off of each other, it's extremely hard. Why? Because one, hard to defense against, two, can't miss a tackle, three, they are they are enjoying themselves, right? Uh, they're not looking under pressure. And when they're enjoying themselves and they have this freedom to express themselves, it, it was beautiful. So Irish attack is slowly changing in the way that they are interplaying with each other. So... Uh, where, where they were more hitting forwards then hitting into the back line and trying to use their wings or getting into those into those elements where Hansen and Lowe can really play and um, you know utilize what they want with their one-on-ones they've started an introduction of interplay between both outfits um, and I, I think this is this is where they're going so we'll see a lot of different in-play moves, so in running time, not, not of a set piece, but in open play where these two parties are linking very well, and it's not just, oh, okay, forwards are going to smash and then we're going to get the ball to the back line, they're going to do something. It's now, okay, I've got two forwards, two back line players running at you at the same time, distributing ball between each other and just having fun with it. Yeah, that, that that's where the Irish attack is at the moment. So let's watch it, guys. Let's watch how well they interlink and interplay with each other. Let's enjoy that type of brand that they're going to play. Um, and I think that they aren't scared to play that long. Um, I mean, we saw it first three minutes, right? So I think that Irish rugby is going to be doing this. Um, there'll, there'll be a bit of territory game. I mean, all of these playoff games will see quite a, a territory battle. Sexton is brilliant at that. But it's that the combination at the moment. And it's, it's almost... New Zealand does it very well as, as well. 
Uh, but Ireland is just gelling as a team a bit better for me. So as a manager, as a coach um, of how to bring players together, Ireland has got the good mix. Okay, so wasn't too strategical. It's 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 that phase of where Ireland is going and just praising their defense of how well it sets, how well their first time tackles, and how well they just completely break down the moral of teams. Now let's look at New Zealand. Firstly, defense. Um, now when New Zealand defense guys, it's extremely physical, just just like the carrying right. So. I think New Zealand prides themselves more on physicality and ruck play over setting the defense line. Don't get me wrong, the defense line is set there. Guys, I'm, I won't be able to fold teams too greatly at the moment because we are looking at the top eight teams in the world going, going at each other. Now, where New Zealand lacked against France for me is longevity. Now, France scored those two, those two phenomenal tries towards the end of the game, guys, right? So first half deadlock, just like I said it was going to be, it was deadlock. But it didn't last long enough. And as soon as the subs were made from Ian Foster, that's where it started changing. Now, are Ireland going to try play that game where they are letting, letting them set their defense and they are trying to see where the cracks are and do the interplay and maybe try and run, run them out of steam and wait for the bench to come because the bench isn't as formidable as the starters. And then using the cracks of the bench to, you know, hit into that. Because I don't think that this New Zealand team is as well gelled as what we've seen in the past from other New Zealand teams that have won World Cups. Um, and, you know, also it's the last, again, the last year of Ian Foster. And then we're seeing um, Scott Scott come into it. Uh, guys, it's... It's that weird change time for New Zealand and it might be to the detriment of them or they might go out of the Big Bang. But in in my personal opinion, it's he's not Steve Hansen. Steve Hansen had a great run of eight years. Um, he did phenomenally. Unfortunately, he couldn't convert his third um, World Cup in 2019. And then Ian Foster got handed over. Really good team, but they struggled. Like, honestly, they struggled in their first um, building phase of the World Cup. And I think that they're not where they'd like to be, uh, or they're not, no, they aren't where other New Zealand teams have been that win World Cups. All right, so guys, please, this is obviously coming from the way I view the game or the way I'm thinking as a coach. Please remember, this is all my personal opinion. You are more than welcome to, you know, give your comments, give your feedback with regards to that. But that's where I am. And defensively, this is where New Zealand, uh, to me, Oh, so guys, yes, they tackle well, they can set their defense, but it's who they're doing it for, why are they doing it, and how long can they do it for? It's it's the questions that are asked in the back room, right? What, what is the conversation happening between captains or forwards and captains and staff? And these fundamentals of the team and what, what, what the jersey means to them, that's going to be the detriment to me of New Zealand defense. Because if the players aren't all aligned and they're not all playing for each other or playing that type of brand, that's where it breaks down. And I think if I compare on paper where Ireland is compared to New Zealand with regards to this, they're ahead. Um, and I hope that New Zealand can find their way to get that defensive line to make their heart, to make their hits. And I think they will. It just depends for how long. All right. Um, yeah, so that was a bit other than strategy. It's more backroom talk. Now, defensively, stuff I need to see from New Zealand is taking care of key players. Bondiaki, guys. As always, you're not taking care of Bondiaki. You're allowing him to offload. He's going to destroy you. Uh, same as for James Lowe. James Lowe, right? He is very physical. Uh, I can't believe how he picks up players for a wing. He's physical. He's strong. They need to take care of him. And none other than, once again, I've, I've said this before, Johnny Sexton. If Johnny Sexton gets destroyed, if you get into his head, if you rile him up, it's it's going to be a difficult day for Ireland on attack, right? And this is the type of things that New Zealand need to look at defensively and the things that need to focus and keep ball in hand, right? Now, both of these teams um, are going to enjoy playing around with the ball. So they, they, they don't need to hold onto that position, uh, you know, like other weaker teams need to do against stronger teams and try to suffocate them. These two guys, are both these teams, they're going to experiment on attack and they, they, they're not going to be shy because they know both the defenses are going to come through. How can New Zealand break through the wall, which is Ireland, on, on attack? Now, I don't think it's a high ball. I think it's 
they, they, they're they going to go, what, what they've been doing, right, is hitting a bit more into the blind side, opening up the space for a one-on-one with Wall Jordan or Talia and hoping for the best. So this is something I'm going to see happening because the pinpoint accuracy of Munga or from if Barons or McKenzie on 15 comes through and they hit into those spaces, that's that's not a 50-50, but it's a, it's a better chance for them than trying to run at that Irish defense and trying to break it down brick by brick. So in my personal capacity as a coach, I want them to work into the blind side, which they do, right? And as soon as that open space is there and we're going to see Talia and Jordan on the wing, they, the cross kicks are going to come. It's going to be who gets the ball, right? And then who's going to set the defense after that. Um, I think this is probably New Zealand's best option on attack of what to utilize. And... I want them to keep the ball alive. I want them to stretch the the Irish defense because if you remember on the Scottish Irish game, Scotland scored two tries within five minutes, second half, right? As soon as Ireland had to do broken play. New Zealand needs to focus as much as on broken play as what they can. And with broken play, I mean that there's no set defense line. There's maybe a line break and then suddenly it's a bit scratchy. Now, New Zealand are brilliant at this, right? And they've done it so many times and their counter-attacks off this is, is is their bread and butter. I want to see this. I want to see New Zealand offloading balls, trying to keep that ball alive as possible, not going to deck, not creating as many rucks, but trying to create that broken play, which forces that uh, Irish team to defend um, running backwards the whole time. So I did say that if... Ireland is able to defend and get New Zealand on that back ball and always cause pressure, game is done, right? But on the flip side, if if New Zealand allows them into that space with that quick defensive uh, line speed that they have, but interplay and offload and offload and almost Fijian style, no, it's a bit more New Zealand style because it's, it's not that one-handed stuff, but, you know, I want them to be able to use that to upset the defense line of Ireland. I think that's their best bet. Um, not, you know, we'll see territory gain from New Zealand as well. They are very accurate. Uh, they'll abuse it. But counterplay is a big one. As soon as the turnover comes, how quick are they going to get the ball to where they want it? And how often can they create a broken defense line with offloads and with just keeping that ball alive? That will be the make or break for New Zealand on attack. And yeah, we'll see that. Set pieces again, guys. Um, the Irish line out hasn't been operating to you know 90 plus percent capacity within the 22 of the opposition i, I said in my previous video as well i'm pretty sure they're continuously working at this the the, the, the line out is good guys I, I just don't want to see the go-to being the mall um the malls are breaking down everywhere and it's it's almost become quite a 50 50 when when two very strong teams are meeting because the the laws are being interpreted differently by each ref and the swimming is different uh, from the sides are different the uh the jumpers and then oh sorry the the lifters and then becoming the pillars on the side everything is being a bit interpreted differently from different refs and the referees then will make quite big calls around the malls so i rather want them to yeah, use more as a launch and ireland will remember i always said uh, from the line out goes to bondi key or from the forwards they launch of that and then attack left or right off of that usually with a small inside pass and running on the 45 now new zealand uses it as well as a launch and then they come into their forwards so i don't think the malls are or should be utilized as much as just using it as a launch platform to get back into the play um, scrums guys I think honestly weight wise um, strategically wise the, the, they're good but how quick can Lucy's influence after a scrum I think that that's a bigger key element to me than anything else is how quick do these Lucy's get off the ball to try and make a tackle to create a turnover somewhere else from a scrum okay and another thing is I think it's a deadlock I don't think we'll see um, any any like massive penalties coming from scrums it's again just a deadlock ball in ball out a bit of pressure and then we soak through uh just i'll use it as a launch pad okay so set pieces again we'll see that um ireland like their trick plays uh i won't be surprised that new zealand as well is if we see a few tap and go penalties but with with a set uh bit of an interplay in between there that teams have been you know holding on to for the the playoff stages of the world cup yeah so there's a bit of strategy from my side yeah, uh, next up, guys, I think let me dive into some key positions. Next, I want to chat a bit about key positions. I have to, and as I always do, start by the 10s, right? So Johnny Sexton versus Richie Maunga. Wow. Um, two of the best 10s in the world at the moment. Um, 
quite different in the style that they play. Uh, I think that Johnny Sexton guys, I've, I've spoken many times because I've covered South Africa, Ireland. Um, I think I've covered Ireland, Scotland as well. So I've spoken a lot about Sexton and the way he plays and what he brings and how Ireland, um, you know, de depends on, on his play style. So let me focus a bit more on Richie Monga. I think I only did New Zealand, France, which is week one, which is opener. I haven't quite um, followed New Zealand or covered New Zealand other than that. So let, let's chat about... Uh, Richie Munger. So, uh, you know, I I live and breathe rugby, so I watch a lot of rugby. Um, it used to be Super Rugby when I was young. Now it's at uh, Super Rugby Pacifica, but it's also, it's it's changed the brand in how New Zealand needs to start playing at local. And once again, guys, Crusaders dominate pretty much everything. So I'm excited for uh, Scott Robinson to become head coach of New Zealand and for, for all those small parts of uh, how Crusaders play and the team gels come together for the New Zealand team. Now, Richie Maunga at Crusaders is extremely expressive. He has some of the players who are next to him on the field. Um, I think Talia is also Crusaders. So he's used to these these players. Now, what, what, what the key difference is between Richie and Sexton is Richie backs himself often with his speed, with his kicking abilities, with with just him as a player, where, where Sexton doesn't often carry the ball to the line. I've never quite seen Sexton chip and chase um, into that space. I've never seen Sexton give himself a grabber or step, step. I think one of the most brilliant tries I've seen from Richie Monga was a short kickoff in his Crusaders jersey. He does this weird 360 spin while catching the ball uh, and sliding, missing three or four defenders. Like it, it was phenomenal, right? So watching that as a coach, it's it's uncoachable. It's just him expressing and enjoying the game. So that's a fundamental difference for me. And that's also the way New Zealand play. The, when they can start offloading and start um, expressing themselves, it, it's it's a very good New Zealand side. It's a very hard side to defend. And it's going to start with Richie Monga. So is Richie feeling himself on the day? Is he going to back himself? Is he going to use his hands? Are we going to see him utilize opportunity and, you know, kind of change the game from that element? That That's what I'm thinking. Um, on the boot towards poles, I think it's quite a narrow match. Uh, Richie did miss one or two easier ones the weekend before, where Sexton, guys, is, you know, steady points. He's going to get you the, the, the points uh, when you go to pole. Uh, Distribution-wise as well, Mohamed's speed um, and the way he links with his back line to me is better than um, Sexton and Ireland. Sexton again just plays where he needs to play and puts the guys into space. He doesn't link with that back line. And when I mean with link, I'm talking about once you've passed your first ball, right, if it's forwards or backs or wherever, to rejoin that line and to create an extra overlap or extra player to, you know, completely have a different or unique attack. Now, if you guys watched the New Zealand game um, against Uruguay last weekend, did you see how, was it Uruguay? I need to go back now. Anyway, did you see how well especially at scrum time, McKenzie and Wilner linked on that blind side. I think they scored three tries doing the exact same move. Um, and that's what I'm talking about, the way he links with them, creating that opportunity. And I think he scored one, McKenzie scored one. I think the wing scored one as well. So it was three, it was the exact same move that they did from a scrum uh, within the opposition 22. But the way they ran off of each other and the timing of it, guys, was, was really good. Now, I don't see Sexton playing that way. Um, Obviously, both of them pinpoint accuracy on the cross kicks. Um, it's a factor for both of them. The wings, I've spoken about that as well. So yeah, key position at 10. All depends if that's going to go, go forward for Rich Maunga. And then, you know, New Zealand will be on the front foot. Another key position I'll talk about, and I'm going to mix and match a bit. So I want to think... Adi Sevilla against Van der They play different positions. I think we'll see Adi at eight probably, and you know Van der is at seven, and it's different. So it's two vital loose forwards, uh, but play very different roles, but fundamental roles. And I've covered Van der multiple times, guys. So the the work he does in rucks, the turnover rates, the carrying, um, you know, all of these elements. He's such a well-rounded player. But the, the brutality, the intenseness that you get from Adi Sevilla is is almost unmatched. Um, you know, I, I, I miss that. It's it's what Dwayne, Dan, uh, sorry, Dwayne Vermeulen used to do. Um, and you know when Adi Sevilla gets that ball, like you've even heard him like almost grunt when he carries, where 
no matter when he gets that ball, he's going at you 200%. Um, and I think that's pivotal for New Zealand's attack because they do depend on him on his carries, they do depend on his physicality, and they, they, they feed off of that. Um, same as the Hurricanes for Super Rugby, when Arnie Sevilla is going good, it's going great. So I want to see how well is Arnie Sevilla going to carry the ball. He he digs in and gets the turnovers sometimes when he needs to, but it's not his primary role, right? Where Van der it's more one of his primary roles. Now, Arnie Sevilla, I want to see him just being extremely physical and taking it to Ireland at any opportunity. If it's carrying the ball, if it's making tackles, if he starts making the statement of physicality, uh, the rest of the team will rally up behind that and they'll hit through. Um, so yeah, I think both of these two loose forwards are pivotal and fundamental for both of these teams and the energy they bring or the, the key roles that they play within their primary roles is going to be huge for both teams. Uh, a last key position I just want to touch on is that of Aaron Smith. I'm not going to speak about his counterpart because I don't know who, who they're going to start. But Aaron Smith, guys, um, has been, I think this is his third or fourth World Cup. I think it's his fourth World Cup. Uh, he's been around a very long time. He plays his full 60 minutes. He rarely goes off before 60 minutes. And his distribution and his decision-making, guys, is is so good and they've always paired Aaron Smith with quite a vibrant energy number nine so Aaron Smith consistency king and then it used to be TJ Paranara unfortunately he ruptured his Achilles before the World Cup so he's not there he's probably my favorite number nine in the world uh, now they, they've changed it with Roy God uh, he's now that energy right and he's he, he's kind of really coming into it in this World Cup uh, try scoring machine at the moment he's, he's eager and it's, it's a really good match at the moment so just back on Aaron Smith as a key position um, very consistent at kicking his box kicks uh, probably the most consistent passer and consistently making good decisions now if anyone here are coaches and or if they've ever just tracked what scrum offs do um, the, the decision making, they're, they're kind of running the whole game. So yes, a 10 is important, he's running his attack, but mostly with backline, he's directing forwards. But inevitable, it's it's the number nine who actually decides where that ball's going. Because even if the 10 shouting his head, but he's seeing something else from the forwards or he's seeing something else, he'll play what, what he feels is best. Now that key decision making is so hard to coach and it takes years of experience. It takes years of, or just hours of game footage uh, to be able to get to that point where 9 out of 10 times you're making the correct decision. Now, we all make mistakes. He's human as well. <laughs> but but the percentage of mistakes he makes, guys, is is so few. Um, and I think that having this consistency on the team is is fundamental. Is is hard to find in many number nines. Um, I don't think the Irish line is as consistent. Uh, I don't think that uh, the, the vibrant nines coming on when they replace him are doing that as well but they, they bring that different element that they need so yeah fundamental or you know just such a key position for me is Aaron Smith um, I don't think there's a nine that matches him at the World Cup I know people tell me DuPont or uh, you know there are different nines who are what they are because they are so brilliant but it's just not Aaron Smith to me uh, yeah guys so those are my key positions I'm covering um, I'm mixing and matching a bit because I, I don't just want to go head on head uh, there are different players who bring very important skills to the team that I just wanted to cover on that. All right. So if you have any key positions that you think I'm missing out, uh, I know Dane Coles, I would cover him as well. Brilliant. Number two, uh, if there are anyone else from Ireland or, or uh, New Zealand that you guys would have wanted to see, just pop it into the comments there for me and I'll make sure whichever team goes forward, um, I'll cover those positions for you. So prediction time. This is the real tough time. Um, as much as I enjoy New Zealand rugby, as much as I think Ireland is on top of their game, my prediction is Ireland. Um, I think that this will be an extremely physical battle. I think this will be quite a narrow battle, and I don't think the margin is going to be that big. Um, I think the teams will feel each other out on first half. I think scoreboard pressure from Ireland, uh, possibly with a good try from interplay. And I think a try from New Zealand first half as well, um, because, you know, they're going to pounce on any opportunity they get. 
and it's going to be narrow. So let's say first half, there's a three or four point difference, maybe a 12-8, maybe a 12-7, something like that. Uh, second half, so as my prediction for the defense of New Zealand or Ireland, there's going to be a crack that New Zealand can really uh, try capitalize on. So there'll be two quick tries, uh, I think similar to what Scotland did, New Zealand will really try uh, you know, make the most of that opportunity. There'll be two quick tries, but I think in the same being said, Ireland would have set their pattern and would have also scored two tries. So now my points are going a bit bigger, but the margin is staying the same. I'm going to call a, I think a 28-22 for Ireland. Um, I think I see two tries, second half for both teams, but the points and the opportunities and the penalties conceded, uh, I think I think New Zealand's going to concede a bit more penalties. So yeah, prediction: Ireland to go through 28-22 narrow game, physical battle. It's going to be lovely rugby to watch. <clears throat> my God, my God, and that's a wrap. So I have covered New Zealand, Ireland. What a what a coverage, guys. Um, if you are agreeing and disagreeing, please pop it into the comments. I'd, I love to hear. I love to get interactive. Uh, this is a tough one. They're all going to be tough from here on out. Playoff rugby, I can't wait to just sit this weekend and really get into that spirit of the World Cup and enjoy watching it. Uh, I hope that you've enjoyed the content. I hope that it's given you some insights. And uh, I, I know I spoke quite a bit about, uh, other than strategy, just you know what, what's happening in the background as a coach or as a manager. And there's always small elements that we have to consider uh, you know, for, the, for the full picture. Uh, it's very difficult. A lot of knowledge and experience to get to that place where you understand all the small parts that come together. Um, so guys, thanks so much again to all the fans, to all the enthusiasts, to all the you know people who just love consuming rugby and again always to the emerging coaches. Um, thanks so much for sticking around, for giving me your support. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe to my channel. Uh, I'll be definitely putting out the next two games as well. And yeah, enjoy the rugby this weekend, guys. Cheers.